Well, it may not be Ebola, but it certainly is a big concern, so we're going to talk about it tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. The Zika virus has got a lot of people worried. It starts in Brazil, and now there are some, I don't know, 48 cases here in America at our most recent counts. Uh, that number could be growing, and we are honored to have the Director of Health here tonight to talk to us about what the concerns are and what the advisories are and what you ought to be concerned with, especially those uh, who happen to be pregnant. So stay tuned for that. Welcome in to my state of mind on this Thursday evening. In the meantime, it's all about the truck tolls. Let's go to the let's go over here to the rundown and, and and talk about this. You know, this is getting to be really silly on on X number of levels. The speaker Mattiello has got a new phrase he's using, and that's it: the loud minority of no. Uh, we had a headline that talks about the, you know, the, the, this is. The RIPEX study suggesting that there's going to be a flush DOT of $700 million. In other words, there's more on the back end for the DOT than we bargained for as taxpayers. And so they're going to still knock out some of the nuts and bolts of this truck toll debate while I'm hoping you're knocking out your legislators, not literally, but figuratively, and letting them know that come November, if they don't rethink this thing, there could be a price to pay here. Uh, what's really concerning me, though, is that anybody who has an opposition stand, and maybe it's just WPRO radio and a chubby guy in the TV and a few others that are, that are in the crosshairs of the speaker, but listen to what he said at the Chamber of Commerce yesterday. We have too loud a minority voice of no that wants to get nothing done, and that's not the minority party. The minority voice of no that wants to cripple this state. We put a referendum question in there, which, by the way, generally I don't like, but to deal with that loud minority voice of no, we, we wanted to just be clear as to the intent in the legislation and that this is a plan to toll very large trucks and, and not passenger cars. You know, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'll get to the passenger car situation in a second, but y you got to be kidding me. The loud minority of no, eh, eh, that's not very mature, okay? There, we, we are not trying to damage the state. People who have an opposition point of view are not trying to damage the state. What we're trying to do is have a voice on a very important issue. It's called America. It's called democracy. And you, you really can't win the day. You may win the argument, but you can't win the day with this electorate positioning them in that manner. It's just not very high level. In the meantime, there's some faulty arguments that, that are, are being made here. Let me, let me just show you this headline as kind of the scene setter for yesterday. It, and let me run this story to try to bring you up to date on what's going on. Dozens of people testified into the night about the new roadworks bill introduced Wednesday. Somebody needs to tell me when is the last time there was ever an industry in the state of Rhode Island that stepped forward and said tax me more. Trucker Mike Collins said he'd rather pay a higher diesel tax than the tolls proposed. Under the plan, it would cost $20 to cross the state on I-95. RIDOT Director Peter Alvidi made his big pitch to the Senate Finance Committee. We still have the worst bridges in America. A new plan to fix those bridges and roads that borrows $420 million and includes 14 electronic toll gantries for large commercial trucks. He argues they cause the most road damage and don't contribute enough funds. In a letter to the committee from Cumberland Farms obtained by Eyewitness News, the company says their fleet of trucks contribute plenty through fuel taxes, fees, and permits. That company urges lawmakers to reject roadworks. They have a substantial impact on the state because they employ so many people. Senator John Pagliarini introduced two resolutions, one to ban tolls, the other to require a public referendum on tolls. Because I don't think that people will approve the tolls. And supporters of roadworks from labor unions also demonstrated at the State House Wednesday afternoon. It's slated to create 6,000 jobs. All right, by the way, is Cumberland Farms in the loud minority of no? Legitimate concerns, right? Uh, so that gives you an overview. Here's something that Peter Alviti, the gentleman who was in the uh, package there, the director of the DOT, said that just um, has me shaking my head. Please run it. Very important similarity, however, to the last bill is that it only authorizes tollings of class 
eight and above trucks, tractor trailers and lodgers. And in this version of the bill, tolling of passenger vehicles, that's motorcycles, cars, SUVs, vans, and pickups, would require a statewide referendum of the people. We want to be very clear here. We have no intention of tolling cars, not now, not ever. Here's the thing, Mr. Elviti, you're not the king of the DOT, you're an appointee. The governor is not a lifelong elected official, neither, neither, the House Speaker might think he is, he might learn that lesson sooner or later. Who follows down the line? That when you've got $45 million of infrastructure up, it's sitting there waiting to be used for a revenue stream from others, and the legislation that they're writing can simply be rewritten. It's not a constitutional amendment. It's not a referendum that's demanded by the Constitution. It's just demanded by legislation, which can be changed. And what, what if a lawsuit occurs? What if the truckers, by the way, will be the only state in the country that's doing this statewide only for trucks and only for certain kinds of trucks? What if a discrimination lawsuit wins the day? Well, the infrastructure will be up. What do you do now? Toll everybody. These are legitimate questions. And finally, on this concept, on the truck tolls, I'll just run this front page again. This is not about labor. Here's the thing. Nobody is arguing whether we should fix the bridges. We have to fix the bridges, which means no matter how we fund it, pay as you go, borrow some money, tolls, no tolls, Good laborers, I love labor, construction workers, they're gonna to have to put jackhammers in the ground and fix the bridges. We're not fighting with labor. Nobody should be fighting with labor on this one. We want labor to be done, we want jobs to be created. That's a non-starter, completely a non-starter. All right, the mosque visit. Real quick on the president, just kind of checking in with the rest of the country. Uh, this headline uh, kind of tells the story and uh, I guess there are a couple, I think we have a couple headlines here. It's always controversial, right? It's almost like you can't win or can't lose, but sometimes you gotta make a better decision. CBS reports. Neighbors waved hello as President Obama arrived at the Islamic Society of Baltimore. A few protesters lined the motorcade route as well. Inside, Muslim Americans told President Obama about the increased bias they faced. They talked about how their children were asking, are we gonna be forced out of the country? Are we going to be rounded up? Why do people treat us like that? Conversations that you shouldn't have to have with children, not in this country. We've asked him to uh, make such a visit uh, for a number of years now. Ibrahim Hooper is the communications director for the Council on American Islamic Relations. He says Muslim Americans are more afraid now than at any time in history, even after 9-11. Thanks to Donald Trump and Ben Carson and others, Islam, Islamophobia has been mainstreamed, uh, which makes it all the more dangerous. President Obama says Christians and Jews need to speak out when they see anti-Muslim rhetoric. We have to understand, attack on one faith is an attack on all our faiths. And he called on Muslims not to become cynical, saying they're not Muslim or Americans, but Muslim Americans. You know, I, I, I agree with the sentiment that the politics of the day have really damaged the relationship you know, amongst Americans, including Muslim Americans. We've chronicled that here. We've done plenty of shows here on that. And so I empathize and sympathize with that point of view. And I think many of us should, all of us should. The president's got to pick his battles, though. You show up at a mosque in Baltimore that's been under the FBI watch for the last few years. Why are you poking that particular bear? There are other places. All right. And finally, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the politics of this. This has been a crazy political process for the presidency so far, right? So now they're sparring last night over who's the progressive. The headline, CBS has got a quick ditty on this. At a town hall event last night, the candidates continue to spar over which one of them deserves to be called a progressive. You can't be a moderate and a progressive. They are different. It's very hard to see how any of his proposals could ever be achievable. Sanders is counting on the youth vote to win. He understands the fact that things aren't easy. Young volunteers are also supporting Clinton. Women's rights, that's something that Secretary Clinton strongly believes in and will always fight for. About 40% of voters in New Hampshire are not registered in any political party. They can make up their minds on primary night.
Here's what I can't figure out. Well, I understand the politics of the Democratic nomination, just like I understand the politics of the Republican nomination. But fighting too hard to get that nomination by labeling yourself a progressive, put yourself in a tough spot in a general election. And the rules kind of apply on both sides. They got to temper that. They got to temper the labels because the Americans are in the middle. In case you're scoring at home. Oh, and by the way, uh, Larry David and Bernie Sanders are the same person, confirmed last night by Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it on that. All right, Zika virus, you're hearing a lot about it, and I bet you a lot of you don't even know what it is. Let me run a few headlines here that kind of uh, describes what, we are, uh, what we're talking about here. The Red Cross is talking about days to wait before you donate blood. Health officials, the Washington Post report, uh, urge uh, people to be careful in, the, in terms of their travel. Florida declares a health emergency and that kind of sets the table for our new director of Department of Health in Rhode Island, Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott. I am honored to have you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having nice me. Nice to meet you. You as well. Sh short answer, and then we'll kind of get into it in our following segments. Something to be really concerned about here in Rhode Island, yes or no? No, something to be aware about. Um, also for folks to know who are traveling, but something that we will continue to learn more about as we go. Zika virus is a mosquito-borne illness. Um, a mosquito has to be infected with the virus in order to transmit it to someone. And the mosquito usually travels uh, in areas that are in the southern U.S. and the Caribbean and South America. All right, there's your short answer. When we come back, we'll break it down and talk about some of the other initiatives the Department of Health is getting into. Stay with us. Florida's emergency health order clears the way for crews to take action against the Zika virus, like spraying for mosquitoes. There are now at least 48 patients in the U.S., all travelers who brought the virus back from Zika-stricken countries, except for one in Dallas who had sexual contact with someone who recently returned from Venezuela. In hard-hit Brazil, soldiers are getting rid of stagnant water in an effort to kill mosquito larvae. Zika is linked to birth defects, and pregnant women have been advised to avoid travel to countries where the virus is spreading. Wednesday, CBS News confirmed United Airlines offered to reassign certain flight crews concerned about contracting the virus on routes to Latin America and the Caribbean. Other airlines are reportedly doing the same. In Atlanta, the CDC has activated its operations center. For Zika, we have people that are experts in vector-borne viral disease, in birth defects, and in reproductive health all in one place so they can work on these different aspects of the problem. The CDC is advising pregnant women to protect themselves if their male sexual partner has traveled to a country where Zika is spreading. The virus can stay in an infected person's bloodstream for about a week. It always concerns everybody when we start to talk about sexual transmission, you know, communicable aspect to these kinds of things it takes it to another level, right? right? Right. It's definitely something new that we're learning about this virus. It's not um, explicitly known to be sexually transmitted, but as people are learning more, it's worth making sure that we all practice safe sex um, when we're able to appropriately. Is this, is this a new version? I mean, this is not the first time we've had this problem, right? Zika virus is a virus that's been known in African and Southeast Asian countries. It usually causes a mild illness. Oftentimes, if someone is infected, one out of five people will actually show symptoms. Mm. What's new is last year, it became um, evident as an illness in the Caribbean and South America. And that's when we started seeing the association with babies being born with microcephaly, otherwise known as the smaller sized head that many people are talking about. That's serious stuff. It's definitely something that people want to know about and should be aware about. It's also why we're talking about the travel advisory, that if you have the opportunity to delay your travel, if there is a woman who is pregnant, until we can continue to learn more about the virus, then that's something that um, you should do. Ebola scared the living daylights out of everybody, mm -hmm. and now it has been, well, it's off the news, mm -hmm. uh, which means that there was a pretty good international response mm -hmm. to this whole thing. Yeah. Um, does this rise to that kind of level at any projected point, do you think? In a similar way, um, Ebola was a virus that we had to learn more about. And we saw in order for it to be eradicated, we needed a strong public health 
infrastructure and response system. So we're in that same pattern now. We're learning more about this virus. We're bringing awareness to people, making sure they're, um, they know about the travel advisory and they can go to our Department of Health website, www.health.ri.gov and get linked to the CDC website from there to know the list of countries. There are roughly about 30 countries that people should be aware of with traveling. And as we will continue to learn more, we'll also come up with the strategies that will help people protect themselves and to be aware. Right, do we have concerns about mosquitoes here in, in you know, this summer? Is it, is it gonna be a thing for us? The type of mosquito that is known to um, travel with Zika virus also has dengue virus and chikungunya virus associated with it. Easy for you to say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Those mosquitoes don't tend to come up as far into the northeast as um, uh, others do, so there's less likely a chance of local transmission here in Rhode Island with that virus certainly now because of the colder weather yeah. but it's something that with the travel for people to be aware of and to know what to do to help prevent mosquito bites which is spray yep right? you can use DEET you can use uh, longer clothing protection where you can you can avoid going out during areas or times of the day when mosquitoes tend to be more prevalent and avoid areas that mosquitoes tend to be around where there might be um, water collections that mosquitoes tend to be drawn towards. So there are things people can do to protect themselves and to prevent the risk of this virus. All right, so, uh, and it's a stay tuned type of thing, right? Because these things yes. can morph and change yeah. and all that kind of thing. And, and that's why I'm here. We'll continue to talk about it. We're available for right. questions and we wanna help people be informed and know what they can do. All right, uh, the director's got a lot on her plate, including some of the initiatives you heard about in the state of the state with the governor's plan. We'll talk about that and a whole lot more. Don't go away, right back. So a whole bunch of things we can talk about with Dr. Alexander Scott. You know, we have done, I think, no less than a dozen shows on the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, governor Raimondo, uh, in her state of the state the other day, uh, discussed you know it's almost it was almost tragic that her goal was to cut opioid over, heroin related overdoses by a third when I heard that, I mean I listen I, I'm not criticizing the the uh, objective I think the objective is tragic right in a way don't yep. you think yep we definitely want to do more we're setting the bar at what we need to achieve there's been an entire statewide effort uh, over the last five years, we unfortunately lost a thousand lives to overdose deaths. And that it's is preventable, and it's absolutely what we want to stop for going forward. So with the governor's leadership, we have four strong strategies in place. We're addressing prevention, treatment, recovery, and reversal. And with implementing that statewide, we definitely want to reach decreasing the amount of overdose deaths by a third in the next three years and go even more than that so that we have fewer and fewer pre preventable deaths occurring. You know, it's so funny, I was, I was, uh, I was uh, hanging out with a couple of buddies last night mm -hmm. and we were talking about the Percocets and the Vicodins mm -hmm. and we keep coming back to this and I keep reminding people of my hangout ability you know, be careful with this stuff. The, the dental pain relief, the back pain relief, all those kinds of things have turned this crisis into something which does not reflect the average stereotypical, lack of better term, with no judgment, deadbeat, heroin, shooter-upper type mm. of person. This whole thing, not that, not, not that everyone is not equal in God's eyes, but you know my point, this mm. thing has morphed into a whole bigger territory. Yeah, prescription drugs are critical to decrease the supply of out in the community. We know that many people that start off with prescription pain medications oftentimes 
transfer into heroin and other stronger narcotics that put them at much higher risk well, of the overdose uh, epidemic. The, the Medical Society folks were here the other day and they had some interesting thoughts on this. Are you having a dialogue with the Rhode Island Medical Society, with Absolutely. doctors in general? I mean, you're one. I mean, how many times have you prescribed? You're a viral person, right? You're, you're, you're uh, um, an infectious and, disease by, by trade, correct? Absolutely, yes. So, so would, you, would you, in your own previous, are you still practicing, by the way? I'm not statutorily of, allowed, uh, to. allowed to. I miss my patients, but working well, on their behalf. Were you issuing these kinds of medicines? Yes, pain is a normal part of the medical care that we we're providing or that providers um, give. And what our goal is to make sure that people prescribe responsibly. And the providers in Rhode Island want to do that. We want to decrease the amount of um, prescription pain drug use that's out there. We need to raise awareness with patients and make sure that they know not to take medication any longer than usual. We need to make sure that there are alternatives that we go to before we go to narcotics. There are other options that we can use to address their pain. The Good Samaritan bill was finally put back into play after a little bit of a waylay. It expired, it sunsetted, and then there was controversy as to whether or not, and the sunset, the Good Samaritan bill simply, folks, is um, it relieves the response of, if, if, if I'm taking, if I'm on probation, I got a drug charge, you're my pal, and you're down for the count, and we've called 911, I, I need to stay in there without fear of being arrested. Correct. That's what it's about. The sus medical society folks were saying there's a little bit of a nuance in this thing that they're concerned about, and that is if I'm suspected of dealing or delivering drugs at the scene, that I still might be susceptible to arrest. Are you worried about that little nuance in the legislation? That's a part that we still want to address together, but I celebrate the General Assembly, who did an amazing job within 21 days of the legislative cycle starting again. We passed quickly the Good Sam uh, bill into effect, the governor signed it, and there's no sunset. So we took care of the part that wasn't controversial that we still need to work through to make sure that lives can be saved. And that's a tremendous thing that Rhode Island has done as a state. And we'll continue to work with the governor's overdose task force, um, the providers, and the legislators who are part of it to help work out some of these other elements because we have to save lives. No one should be dying anymore from these overdose deaths. You like your job? Loving it. I'm loving it. Why? I have an awesome team. I've been with the Department of Health since 2009 because I was working there while also doing my academic clinical work. And I've known since the beginning it's a group of folks who are committed to public health and to making a difference whether I'm there or someone else is there. And you can't beat that. And I've loved being able to work in this administration. The governor has tremendous leadership and Secretary Elizabeth Roberts. We're all looking to make a difference. And um, it's such an opportunity that I just want to be able to add value, so I'm grateful and want to do the best I can. What's your biggest challenge or worry? Uh, the biggest one is making sure that the vulnerable populations in our state are cared for. When we talk about health and optimizing health, a big part of our message is that it's not just about health care. Health care is about 10 percent of what happens with addressing people's health. It's understanding what's going on in their communities, what their environmental exposure is. We're hearing all about the, the lead, which mm -hmm. the governor supported in the budget for us this year, um, and understanding what their housing experience is like, what their substance abuse or mental health issues are like, all of the additional components that go on outside of the health care world. And I want to make sure the vulnerable populations that have some more challenging situations where they're living addressed so right. that everyone's health can be optimized. Stay in touch with us. Thanks for the update Absolutely. on Zika. Absolutely. Thanks for having Good me. Good luck in the new gig. Thank you. All right. Final word and waking back. Stay with us. So coming up on the program tomorrow on WPRO, we'll be following this whole truck toll saga because it's a developing and racing saga to the end. Well, also on the TV show tomorrow night, we'll be talking about steroid use with athletes. Good night.